My name is Tom Patry. I'm a PGA professional. I'm the uh, founder and director of instruction at TP Golf Schools in Naples, Florida. Yeah, I got my start in golf uh, at a public golf course on Long Island. My dad was a restaurant and catering manager at a public facility on Long Island called Spring Lake Golf Club on the east end of Long Island about 120 years ago and uh, started as a junior golfer uh, with one club, a, a broke off Sam Snead Blue Ridge 7 iron and um, I remember the first day hitting golf balls actually. Uh, you know, as a little kid, split hand grip, just whacking at it. And I remember catching that one golf ball, that one particular shot right in the middle of the club face and the ball getting up in the air and, and going out towards that 100 yard marker. And, and, and that was it. It was like uh, somebody stuck a drug in my arm. And, and I'll never feel, I mean, I can remember the day. I mean, thousand years ago I can remember that occurrence and, and I was hooked and that was it. I started playing junior golf when there were real, it was really very little junior golf to play in uh, about 1972 or 3 um, and I remember that first junior golf tournament I played and I, I shot a sterling 144. Uh, it was a brilliant round of golf uh, um, and I, I happened to be paired with a kid I'll never forget this named Gordon Becker and he shot 76 and I thought to myself it's impossible that somebody's that much better than me, and that even drove the nail in even further. I mean, then I was really crazed. Uh, uh, I remember that winter actually shoveling snow off the driving range tee as a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, whatever I was, and, and just wanted to hit golf balls all the time. I remember, you know, getting dark during the winter on Long Island at 4.30, 5 o'clock at night, and getting off the school bus at 3.30 and running. We lived on the facility and running up to the, the range and shoveling snow off to hit golf balls because I, you know, I, I, had this, I had this kid's image in my mind, this kid Gordon Becker's image in my mind and how badly he beat me. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't going to happen again. So how about 365 days later from that date, uh, I played in that same event and broke 80 in a year. So 144 to 77 or 78 in a calendar year. So that, that's pretty crazy. I mean, thinking back about that, and I, you know, it inspires me now when I teach kids you know, who really think they want to be good or think they work hard. I tell them that story, and they think that I'm making it up, and, and I'm not. And uh, I just think if you're going to be good at this game and you don't have that kind of work ethic, it's not going to really work out very well for you. You know, it, it's funny. The, uh, the professional at the club my dad was at didn't have a real affection for junior golfers. Um, but across town in the same little village, I, I grew up in a place called Middle Island, Long Island, New York. Uh, there was another 27-hole public facility, and there was a PGA professional there named Mike Wands. And um, I, I used to go over there and play a little golf. And, uh, and Mike was very, very inviting. Um, so much so that I, uh, I ended up working there the following summer in the pro shop and, and cleaning clubs and uh, pulling carts and stuff. And, and Mike really encouraged me to play. And, and wasn't really uh, much of a teacher, but was a fairly good player, and he was just a positive influence. And, and he really pushed me up the mountain more. And I, not that I needed a lot of pushing, because I didn't, but he was very encouraging to me, and he, and he helped me with my equipment, and, and, and you know, encouraged me to play in more tournaments, and, and, uh, and went out and played with me in the afternoons, and, and really was a, a big influence on me. My dad was an absolute horrible golfer. Uh, he was, uh, sorry, he was, uh, pathetic, uh, in, incredibly bad, and not a very good listener. And as I got better and uh, started winning junior events in the area and, and uh, in the Met area, um, we did play quite a bit of golf together, but um, it wasn't real reception, receptive to help. So no, it wasn't, wasn't much of an influence. I did enjoy playing with any, you know, you know, and, and that's, that's one of the things that I really enjoy today. Uh, you know, so many of my kids come to me uh, with their parents who play golf especially in the market I'm in now in Naples, Florida. Um, golf is a family activity. Um, and I really enjoy seeing my guys and my gals play with their parents. I've got a, you know, quite a few juniors that I teach and, uh, and I, 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 teach, I teach them and play with them. And sometimes I play with them and their parents and that's a, that's a fun afternoon for me. Um, kind of a little lightning in a bottle, 1981. Um, my senior year at Florida Southern, um, I, uh, I had a little period there. I, I uh, had a good season uh, as a college player. I won a couple of college events during the regular season. I was at Florida Southern. And then uh, we had about two and a half weeks off between the end of our school year and uh, the NCAA Division II National Championship we, we had qualified for as a team. 
So I went back to Long Island to practice because the NCAA that year was being played in uh, Simsbury, Connecticut, just outside of Hartford. And I played in a pretty good sized amateur event in Long Island called the Richardson Memorial, which was an invitational. And, uh, and the week before the NCAA, I won it. I beat a guy named Bob Housen who had won, I'm going to make this up, but between eight and 10 New Jersey amateurs. So it was a big boost in my confidence right the week before. And then went up to Hot Meadow in Simsbury the following weekend, and I, and I won the individual title. And the team won the team title by 35 shots. So it was a pretty nice one-two punch there uh, for a couple weeks. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was, it's obviously a great memory 100 years later, but uh, that was really fun. Well, you know, Florida Southern was interesting back then. It was a Division II school, but Charlie Matlock, who was our coach, was really brilliant back then. It was, it's, college golf is very different then. He, he really believed in playing almost primarily a Division I schedule. Um, because he felt like if you played a division, a division one schedule all year long, and you saw the likes of in those days, Paul Azinger, Freddie Couples, Mark Kalkavecki, Corey Pavin, Bob Tway, Willie Wood, Joey Sindelar, John Cook, those were all contemporaries back then, and that's who we saw as a division two team all year long. And then you went to division two nationals, you almost felt like it was a little bit of a layup. Um, and I'm not knocking division two at all, but it was different. Like I said, it was different back then. But those were the guys we played played with, you know, week in and week out, and uh, and still some of my friends today. Um, so it, it was Charlie had a pretty good idea, you know, how to get ready. I played from 1981 to 1988 professionally. Um, made it to the final of two European Tour schools. Um, you know, I, I had my moments. I, I played the South African Tour in '84. Um, had a nice finish in the South African Masters that winter. Um, but I was kind of like the, uh, the white six foot three point guard in the NBA. I was about a step too slow uh, and, and about three inches too short. Um, and although I was pretty competitive, I, I, I got to the point where I realized I was chasing my tail a little bit. And, uh, and I didn't want to wake up and be a 55 year old or a 45 year old journeyman. Um, and I decided to change paths. I got to the point where I was, it wasn't really being discouraged. It was just being, I think, a realist. And I knew I had to go in a different direction. And I really didn't want to be a club pro. I didn't, I didn't see myself folding shirts and uh, dotting scorecards. Um, and I didn't know if there was a place for me in the business. I didn't picture myself as a teacher because I had no teaching experience. And I don't, I don't think even to this day because you're a good player, you're a good teacher. So I took about a year off and I, I interviewed for a bunch of jobs on Wall Street. Uh, a couple on Madison Avenue in New York. That was kind of my wheelhouse and my turf. And I was actually offered a bunch of really nice positions using golf as a vehicle. But then I, I thought about that and I, I thought that would kind of bastardize the game. You know, I didn't feel right about using the game that way. I, I just didn't, it didn't feel right to me. And uh, somebody introduced me to a fellow named John Kennedy, who at the time was the PGA professional at a place called Cold Spring Country Club on Long Island. And he said, just go talk to John and get some advice. He's a pretty insightful guy. And I did. And it wasn't really, he, he had hired his staff for the following year. And uh, a 15 minute discussion turned into a couple of hours. And I, I left there, you know, with a little bit of an insight, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And John called me back um, a couple of weeks later and said, I'd like you to come teach for me here. And I'm thinking, man, I, I don't have any experience. He goes, no, you're going to be fine. You can, you can do this. That relationship turned into a position later on when he became the director of golf at Westchester Country Club in New York, and he hired me as his director of instruction. That really launched my career. That was the home of the Buick Classic at the time, and it gave me exposure to, you know, the best players and teachers in the world every year. And he basically gave me a blank slate and told me to go create something. We inherited a teaching program that wasn't very, very good at the time, and we uh, we turned into something really special there over the next 11 years. So that really that really launched everything for me, and it was, it was, it was because John had the confidence in me that he gave me a, to give me a chance. So Bill Strasbaugh was a, uh, as, ever, as anybody in the PGA of America knows, is a legend in teaching. He was uh, the 99 National Teacher of the Year, and uh, Bill's gone now, but was, you know, was an icon in teaching in a very quiet, kind of Harvey Pennock type of way. Uh, and I met him in a 30-second meeting at the PGA Merchandise Show, I believe in 1982, the first year I turned, I was trying to play some mini tour golf, 
and it was a it was a brief meeting through a, another professional. I had no idea who he was, and uh, and I was on my way. I was actually at the PGA show trying to find a sponsorship to, to play. And uh, fast forward eight years later, when I stopped playing, and John gave me a chance to teach Cold Spring Country Club, I, I you know I, in my opinion, I couldn't teach a dog to bark, and. Uh, I was trying to figure it out, and I was slumming through PGA Magazine, of all things, one night in my room, and there was an article about this guy, Bill Strassbahn. I wouldn't really have remembered the name, but there was a picture of him in there, and he was a, a distinct-looking character, and, and I, uh, I remembered him. And he was at Columbia Country Club in D.C., and I, uh, I called Columbia Country Club the next morning, seeing if I could, you know, maybe go see him and spend some time with him. You know, thinking, you know, he, he, you know we, we met for 30 seconds, seven years ago, he's not going to remember me, so I'd reintroduce myself. And he got on the phone, and I said, Bill, Tom Patry, and he said, Tom, yeah, we met at the PGA Merchandise Show in 1982. Uh, you won the 81 NCAA at Hop Meadow, and I think you're teaching New York for John Kenny now, Cold Spring Country Club. I'm thinking to myself, who is this guy? What planet is he from? And how the heck does he remember that? So we made a date, and I went to D.C., to see him. Remember, I took a day off. We made a date to go down and see him. I went down the night before, drove from New York to D.C., um, and uh, we, I walked into the shop, and you know, he was very old school. He had the blue blazer on, the shirt and tie, and the Panama hat. That's the way he taught. And we went out to this area at the back of the range where he taught. Actually, it was to the left of 18 Fairway where he taught. And uh, we got about 20 seconds into the conversation, 30 seconds into the conversation, and he excused himself. He said he'd be right back. And we only had two hours booked. And he, he drove from this location we were at back to the clubhouse, which is quite a ways away, and he was gone forever. And being the inpatient New Yorker that I am, I thought to myself, I drove all the way down here last night, got a hotel room, I've only got two hours with this guy, and now he disappears in me, and I was really pretty angry. And he comes driving back out, and I'm about to give him a piece of my mind, and he says, you know, Tom, after hearing you just for 20 or 30 seconds, I, I, I realized we needed more time together, so I canceled my entire day. You just take your time. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm so glad I didn't open my mouth. What an idiot. Um, and that was the beginning of a really long relationship. At, at 11.35 that night, we were in an Italian restaurant on, on uh, Connecticut Avenue in D.C., still talking that night. It had been an incredible day, and I got back in the car, and I remember driving up 495 to go to 95 out of D.C., and thinking to myself, who is this guy? This guy is the most incredible human being I've ever met. And that was the beginning of a really long relationship of teaching and spending time together. Um, Bill passed away uh, on September 11th, 1999. And uh, he had a brain tumor. And I remember uh, two weeks before he passed away, he was not in very good shape. And I called Dot, his wife, and I said, I, I, need, to go, I need to see Bill again. She said, well, he's not seeing anybody. He's home. And he's, uh, he's you know, he, he can't speak anymore, and he, you know, he's still alert and everything, but he can't speak. He's lost his ability to speak. I said, I need to come see him, Dot. And she goes, Tom, he's not even really seeing much of family, you know. I said, I want you to go ask him if I can come see him. And she went in and asked him, and she, she, she he wants to see you. So I drove down, and I remember driving down and going to the house, and uh, I actually got in bed with him and laid with him and talked to him, and, and uh, you know, he, he nodded and acknowledged everything I said or squeezed my hand, and... Uh, I spent a couple hours laying in bed with him, talking to him, and, uh, and I, I knew when I left that day that was the last time I was going to see him. But he was an incredible human being and, and somebody that uh, I don't think the PGA of America has done enough to really talk about or recognize. He did some incredible things for people and uh, very, very quietly made a difference in a lot of lives. We talked a lot about teaching originally. You know, um, we talked you know, about you know, ball flight and, and, and influence. We talked about coaching. You know, Bill considered himself a coach, not a teacher. As a matter of fact, people called him coach. They didn't call him Bill. Um, and Bill was more of a coach. You know, he was not, Bill was not a great player, uh, although he loved to play the game, but he was a very astute learner. And uh, we talked a lot about ball fighting. And he was the guy who opened up so many doors for me. He, uh, he was very clear that he was not the only source I should have. Uh, he sent me to people like Gary Wyron and Jimmy McLean and uh, Carl Warren. Uh, you know, I can go on and on. He sent me to a thousand people, and, and 
literally would say to me, you need to go see this guy, you need to go see this guy. And, and over the course of the next five years of my life, um, my Westchester years, you know, I probably spent 25% of my gross income getting on planes and, and paying for hotel rooms, going to see people teach, that he had opened doors for me to go see and do. Um, it was an incredible five or six year journey right at the beginning there, and it was all because of him. Well, I mean, the best example I can give you is, is Bill and Jim Flick were real good friends. And uh, Bill was kind of an inner, inner mass core teacher, and Jim was kind of an arms and hands teacher. And they were best of friends. And I remember having lunch and dinner with them on many occasions, and they couldn't agree on the color white. <laughs> they agreed on nothing. But what a great place for me to sit between them and talk about a particular student that day on the range. And, and Jim said, I think we should, I would approach him this way. And Bill said, no, I would do this with them. And if you looked at it, you know, without any, without any prejudice, you'd realize, yeah, you could make that work, and you could also make that work with that person. So I kind of got a little bit of the best of both worlds in that education process where, you know, the influences that Jim used to teach and, and flight the golf ball and the influences that Bill used to teach and flight the golf ball, which was so different, but allowed you to be pretty diverse in the way you approach things and, and your ability to diagnose, see, and detect what was going to happen and what you could do with a person. Uh, so I was really lucky in that respect to have those guys who were such brilliant teaching minds but so different in the way they approached, you know, making changes in the golf swing. Well, you know, let me back up on my word a little bit here. You know, I, I, I don't think you have to be a good player to be a good teacher, but I think it helps. Uh, I think it really helps, especially when you're teaching the better player or the more accomplished player, because I think the guy who's never been inside the ropes and has never had trouble breathing, hitting a shot coming down the stretch, doesn't really understand that when you're standing in the middle of 18 fairway with a one-shot lead, your track man numbers don't matter a whole lot. You know, um, so I think there's a real balance between teaching and coaching in that respect. Um, but the first thing to be a good teacher, I think the very first thing is you got to be a good listener. Not a good, not a good communicator necessarily first. You got to be a good listener first. You've got to understand what that person really wants, and and then it's not what you want. You know, you know, it's what they want. So you got to listen first, and then and then you've got to communicate. Um, and I think too many young teachers today are too busy trying to impress you with what they know. You know, uh, you know, these kids today are so smart. Uh, they're so technically savvy, but they're too busy trying to impress you with their knowledge instead of fixing your golf game. So I think it, I think you got to really pay attention to the student and what they want first. Um, and that's what I try to do. I try to listen first, understand what they want, make sure they're clear on what they want, what they're saying. Is this exactly what you're asking me for? You'd like this to happen, right? Okay. What do you think it will take to make that happen? And then they usually don't have a game plan, of course. So then the coach steps in and says, okay, well, to, to accomplish that, it might take this much time or this much effort or this much energy. Do you have that much time and energy in your life? You know, will, your, will your life allow that to happen? If not, we might have to backtrack here and, and you know, recalibrate a little bit. And then come up with a really sound game plan as far as time commitment. Uh, and, and, a, and a plan as far as practice and, and you know, and change. You know, to change the physiology of a golf swing is a is a really tall order. I don't think the average player has any idea what it takes to change emotion. Um, and, and I try to get those cards on the table early on in the first session so they really understand what they're getting into. Uh, I think that's I think that's eliminated a lot of people in my teaching stable because I don't think I'm for everybody. I'm not the uh, I'm not a quick fix guy. So the guy who's coming for the quick fix or the Band-Aid, I, I, I'm very clear to them that I'm probably not the right guy for them. So I think, you know, being honest with the student is really important. Even that first year at Cold Spring, uh, when I, I felt like I was not very good at it, I fell in love with it. I, and I didn't think I would. I really didn't think I didn't see myself there. Uh, John, John, sort of, John must have seen something in me, Kennedy, that I didn't see. Thank God he did. Because um, I don't know where I'd be. I, I know I wouldn't be happy indoors right now. I, I, I love now that I'm out here um, every day. Um, but I did grow. I, I grew to love it. Um, 
you know, teaching the average player is, is a real challenge. You know, you deal with a lot of different personalities and a lot of different agendas, um, and, and, and many of them aren't very realistic. Um, so to rein that person in on the coaching side, not the teaching side, and make them understand what they're really asking for and what it's going to take is, is challenging. I think, uh, you know, teaching the game, the X's and O's, is, is really not the hard part. I mean, the golf swing is the golf swing, and there are certain things that we understand happen in the golf swing, and I think most of us can agree on those things. Uh, not all of us, but most of us. Uh, but coaching a person and getting them to really commit to a change and how hard the change is going to be and how long it's going to take, um, it's a challenge with the average player. I, you know, I think in, uh, in 2019, in, in a day of instant gratification, you know, I don't think people understand how hard it is to control a golf ball. There's got to be a plan. I mean, I, I, it's, it's amazing to me, still amazing to me in 2019, how many people aren't fitted. It's amazing to me how many people in 2019 think they can do this without a coach. It's a hard game, man. There's a lot of components. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, it's amazing that people will join a country club and, and spend an incredible amount of money on, on a country club membership or play at a public golf course and pay a high green fee, you know, swing a driver that's four or $500 and, and not take a golf lesson? It doesn't make any sense. To me. And I'm, that's not a paid political announcement. That's just, that's just common sense to me. I mean, I'm 61 years old. I, I still go ask for help from, from my peers. You know, I, if I'm hitting a bad golf shot consistently, I want to know what they see. Um, can I take film of myself? Yeah, but I can't be objective. You know, I love when I look down the range and some amateur's got a video camera out and he's taking video of himself and he's making self, he's doing a self-diagnosis. I'm thinking to myself, boy, you know, if you're a doctor, you'd be sued for malpractice. You know, I mean, I, what are you thinking out there, you know? So I, I think that, uh, you know, statistically such a small part of the golfing population takes instruction or is fitted. It doesn't make any sense to me. I try to be... You know, I try to get refitted every couple of years. You know, there's, the th there's this thing called the aging process going on. You know, things change. Um, so maybe your shaft flex has to change, or, you know, maybe another component of your, ga of your game has to change. Um, I, I think you have to have a plan. You know, I had a, I have a, I have a dream student, actually. Um, we, some guys have a lot of these. I, some guys have never have any of them. Uh, a little girl came to me, uh, at West, during my Westchester years, she was, uh, I always confuse how old she was, but she was probably 11 or 12 years old, and she was a, she was a good little jock, you know. She was a good little basketball player and a softball player, and uh, she didn't really have any golf experience per se. And um, a, a physical therapist in the area sent her to me because he was friends with her parents. She had hurt herself playing basketball, and she was looking for another sport potentially. And she came out like all oh, little kids. She, you know, she didn't know how to grip the club, and she kind of whacked at it and took a slash at it. But she, you could tell right away she was an athlete. And uh, the family, the family didn't, um, wasn't, weren't country clubbers. Didn't have unlimited funds, or, you know, golf's an expensive sport, and they didn't have unlimited funds. But I really took this girl right away in this very first hour. And the parents were at the back of the range, kind of sitting back watching the lesson. And I walked back to them, and I said. Uh, I'd like you to go into the shop and I'd like you to put Megan in my book for an hour every week for the entire summer. And, and the father kind of looked at me a little bit put off and he said, you know, we, you know, we, don't, you know, we can't really afford those kind of things. And I said, listen, I, I didn't ask you about affording anything. I said, I'd like you to go put her in the book. Um, so we'll fast forward uh, about 11 years later. Um, she's 22. She's a rookie in the LPGA Tour. And in her fourth event in Mexico City, she beats Annika Sorenstam in a playoff and wins her first LPGA event. Um, and Megan Francel, who now works for the LPGA, running their Amateur Golf Association, is uh, still a very dear friend of mine, a uh, very close friend of mine, and uh, it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. She had heart, man. She, she, she was a competitor. She had that special thing that you can't teach, and I didn't teach her that. She had that already. Um, I helped her with her golf. I didn't have to help her with her heart or her grit. Um, her father and mother did that. Um, she had that DNA in her. 
Yeah, but she went on a heck of a run there. You know, we, we, she won local junior tournaments, and then she, you know, she won a, st a state junior, and then she won on the AJGA, and then she went on and played uh, at University of North Carolina and won the ACC championship. She won the NCAA East Regional. And, and I was coaching her the whole time, but, you know, I didn't have to worry about Megan working hard on her game. I didn't have to worry about Megan, you know, being committed to, to, to doing her, her, her part of the job. And I knew when she teed it up that she wasn't going to really back down on anybody. So that was something she had. Um, she was special, you know, in, in my life she was. Well, I mean, you know, my first memory of Titus Golf Bowl was probably at Spring Lake Golf Club as an 11-year-old pulling one out of the lake, you know, and somebody hit in there. Um, you know, I'm 61 years old, and I've been with Titus, you know, my, my whole career just about. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, they've been awful good to me. It's, it's a family. It, you know, it's a golf company, but it's a family, and, and they treat us like family. Um, they've always treat, treated me like family. They've done, you know, I'm nobody special, and they've, they've treated me special. They always have. Uh, what, you know, Wally did when he was here, you know, Dave does now, and, but the relationship with Peter Broom and Mary Lou and, and Pelly out in California, you know, it, you know, Karen Gray here today fitting me. Um, I can't even imagine being with another golf company, um, nor would I want to be. Um, a few years back, another company approached me um, when things were really going well for me on the teaching side, and they offered me some cash, and they offered me this, and they offered me that, and I had no interest at all. Um, it, it's, you know, I think in, in 2019, a word that's really undervalued today is loyalty. I'm not going anywhere. Well, I can't be objective because I'm prejudiced. but. You know, I, I, I kid my friends in the business who play another golf ball. I, you know, I go, really? I mean, you know the numbers. You know, you know the facts. I mean, I, I don't get it. You know, I mean, it's it's the greatest golf company on the planet. It's not even it's not even a close second. I mean, I don't know what the what the even what the argument would be. I mean, you know, it's the number one ball in golf. I mean, it always has been and it always will be. Um, anybody that's walked through that ball plant and seen the quality control seen the people who've worked there for 20, 30, and 40 years, you know, who are, who are part of that family, you're going to go play another golf ball? I mean, really? And then you look at a guy like Bob Vokey, a guy like Scotty Cameron. You wear a Foot Joy shoe or put a Foot Joy, Foot Joy glove on, or well, this, this new driver is incredible. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's, it's, it's not even close. It's not even close.